Thank you very much for um, having the patience to, to listen to me again. I'm going to first start with 3D mapping biopsy. Uh, the trust biopsy is the gold standard right now for staging prostate cancer. Unfortunately, we know that it is highly inaccurate. It does not really reflect the extent of patient disease. We know this from studies looking at trust biopsy versus uh, prostates that have been removed, removed at radical prostatectomy. Can we have the house light down just a little bit? Uh, Accurate staging and grading of a patient's prostate cancer affects the therapeutic decision you make. If you have watchful waiting, which is doing nothing, obviously you don't want a patient doing watchful waiting with a significant tumor, which is high grade. And uh, so, you know, it's a critical uh, aspect in, in that um, uh, strategy for management of patient's prostate cancer. Radiation therapy and brachytherapy alone uh, brachytherapy is only good for low-risk patients, so that if you're treating high-risk patients with it, you're going to get failures. Once again, that goes to accurate staging. Uh, the choice, the addition of uh, hormonal therapy to radiation. Right now, high-risk patients get uh, hormone ablation therapy to remove their testosterone, but it's been shown that that improves results in high-risk patients. So once again, if you have uh, a bad cancer, you're going to want to know it so you can be treated appropriately. And suitability for radical prostatectomy. The higher grade cancers, the larger uh, cancers, have a much higher rate of uh, extra uh, uh, capsular extension, which uh, gives you a greater chance of positive margins and failure uh, of the operation. And then lastly, uh, appropriateness for focal therapy uh, or lumpectomy. Basically what we do is put a grid up against the perineum of the patient, behind the scrotum and in front of the rectum, such as this, and we uh, overlay a grid on the ultrasound um, a picture that corresponds to this physical grid, and wherever there is prostate overlying uh, one of these grid holes, we take a biopsy. And these uh, grid holes are spaced every five millimeters. So previously, where you have a 60 gram gland, and there was a set number of biopsies you would take, let's say 10, now we are taking a number of biopsies that's dictated by the size and shape of the gland to cover the gland in a uniform way, irrespective of what its size and shape is. Um, so, do we have a winter? I guess not. Uh, basically, on the left here, you can see this is a normal ultrasound in a 54-year-old uh, normal ultrasound in a 54-year-old fellow who um, had a Gleason 6 one millimeter cancer on the right side, and that is appropriate for watch away. Uh, he came to us when he found out about this 3D mapping biopsy, and what we found, and it's shown on the uh, picture on the, the right, is that all of those little red dots here were actually Gleason 8 adenocarcinoma. And, uh, this is indicative of a lot of patients we see because a transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy usually uh, samples this area but misses this anterior zone. And so this patient was inappropriately treated for a full year before uh, we found out what he really uh, had and, and uh, he was treated appropriately. Another case, and these are not unusual cases, we see this all the time. Transrectal ultrasound out of biopsy in a six-year-old showed a one-millimeter tumor on the left side. It was a Gleason 6, an excellent candidate for watch awaiting. Uh, he was sent to us to fully evaluate him for that. And what we found on his mapping biopsy was every one of these was a positive core. And this pink one was a core that showed extra capsular extension. So going from a watch awaiting candidate, he became an inoperable T3 patient. So in terms of the results, we had 180 patients, all of who had previous trust biopsies. And in this study, each one served as their own control. We restaged each patient with a 3D mapping biopsy. All of these cases were positive only on one side with the trust biopsy. What we showed was that bilateral cancer was demonstrated in 55% of those patients. So in 55% of those patients, we changed their stage associated with their cancer, but words, and 22%, almost a quarter of the patients, increased their Gleason score. 
The Gleason score is the measure of the aggressiveness of the cancer and is a, is a major prognostic factor that we use to decide what types of uh, treatments the patient uh, is going to have. Overall, taking those into account, 70% of the patients would have had their management changed based on a 3D mapping bias. The morbidity was uh, minimal. Uh, we had a 1% rate of hematuria that required a patient to be in overnight to have uh, fluid run through their bladder. And 7% uh, of patients needed a catheter for one to four days uh, because the swelling of the gland uh, put them into retention, but no patient needed long-term catheterization or procedure to uh, sort their urine flow. Uh, as a conclusion to that, uh, basically what we now think is that uh, almost every patient who is diagnosed with prostate cancer, except for those that on their trust biopsy shows extensive high-grade disease, need a mapping biopsy to fully evaluate their situation and to treat them appropriately. And uh, in terms of the cost, morbidity, uh, it is minimal compared to inappropriate treatment and all the problems that, uh, and costs that are incurred because of that. Using mapping biopsy, we were able to now focus in on the cancer and do what we're calling a lumpectomy so that it gives the patient, the reason I call it a lumpectomy because it basically explains in one uh, phrase what we're trying to do. It's exactly the same thing that we're trying to do with for women uh, with breast cancer in terms of lumpectomy. Local control of prostate cancer matters. Amazingly enough, the uh, medical community up until just a few years ago felt that it didn't matter whether you actually control the patient's prostate cancer locally. That uh, those patients that get, got metastatic disease later on uh, didn't get metastatic disease because we left their cancer in and untreated. They got it because they already had it. Uh, and uh, kind of a bad uh, circular thinking there, but uh, it worked because um, you know, we didn't have anything better. Uh, there is recent evidence now to the contrary that if you treat a patient's cancer, it's less likely to metastasize. Well, our hypothesis now is that focal therapy with cryosurgery, and there will be other things that come along to do focal therapy. The concept that's important here is focal therapy. You don't have to treat the whole gland. People will be using high-intensity focus ultrasound, they'll be using lasers, they'll be using IRE, they'll be using a lot of different things. In the end, I don't think it's going to make that much difference as long as you're not trying to use radiation vocally. And we're saying that it is going to give you better control than radical prostatectomy or radiation locally for a certain number of reasons. One is that it is a superior treatment for extracapsular extension. If you have cancer already outside the gland at diagnosis, which is a situation that occurs in routinely in even the low risk patients about 15 to 20 percent of the time, you are going to have a higher risk of positive margins. When you try and remove the gland, you're going to see cancer at the cut surface. Those patients are immediate failures. They go on to radiation now. And so uh, we don't have that problem. We can treat outside the gland as much as necessary to encompass that extra capsular extension. So uh, that's one reason. This is also the only treatment that can be uh, repeated. So that if you do get a failure, you can go back and, and with uh, a reasonable efficacy, retreat that patient. And I'll show you a little bit of data uh, showing that. It is also really the only reasonable treatment, I believe, for radiation failures. Radiation failures can have radical prostatectomies because everything is stuck down and the morbidity and the results are just not good enough to warrant doing a radical prostatectomy now. Um, and so uh, I think if we could treat those patients vocally, it would be a major advance for them. And all of this we think we can achieve with lower morbidity and, and less complications for the patient. Uh, just to show you the most gross example of how we can treat extracapsular extension. This is a patient who had a PSA of 200 when he was diagnosed. He had a Gleason 10, which is the most aggressive cancer you can have. Uh, he was put on hormone therapy, and he became hormone resistant. 
Uh, hormone therapy is the last line of treatment for patients with prostate <coughs> cancer, basically. Chemotherapy usually doesn't work and, and doesn't really extend their lives very much. And so uh, once a patient becomes uh, hormone resistant, uh, their uh, you know, life expectancy is on the order of, of a year. Uh, this is the cancer in this patient. Gross, large cancer growing outside of his prostate into the periprostatic tissue, unresectable. Uh, you could give him radiation, but radiation doesn't work well in high Gleason scores and in large volume disease. We treated him, here are cryoprobes within that tumor mass, and four years post-op, we, uh, this was a CT scan taken three years post-op, you can see that uh, there is no mass anymore, there's just a little bit of a, a scar here, and uh, off hormone therapy, his PSA is undetectable. So what I'm gonna show you is, and again, not what I can just say 100% about anything, what I'm gonna show you is that we can gain local control in virtually 100% of patients, because if I can gain local control in a patient like this, then I should be able to gain local control in just about any patient with minimal extra capsular extension. Retreat. Here's a patient that we saw. We treated with focal therapy on the left side of his gland. And note, this is the center of the, of the gland here. That's the urethra. And this is uh, six years later. And the side of the gland that we treated is basically gone. Okay. This, once again, in, in terms of looking at it in terms of the kidney, this is essentially a removal of that uh, portion of gland. And we see this routinely in patients we look back on. Their gland is basically gone, the area that we've treated. And uh, he, his PSA started to rise six years later. We biopsied him. And again, you see that pattern of, of recurrent cancer in the anterior portion of the gland. He didn't have a mapping biopsy six years ago. It was a transrectal biopsy that we were here. And we just went ahead and froze that region. His PSA is now 0.4 stable. He's potent and continent. And so a failure turns back into a success. One of the advantages of doing focal therapy. Here are 120 patients that we followed from 1 to 13 years on the average uh, approximately 4 years. And uh, of these 120 patients, you can see that the majority of those patients are medium high risk or radiation failures. So this is focal therapy in the full range of patients. Uh, if you think about, if you look out in the internet and, and the medical literature right now, where focal therapy is a, is a hot topic, mostly they're talking about the, the people who have minimal disease and this is the people it's good for. In fact, the people it's really good for, for are the patients that are at high risk because as I'll show you, our results are better for those people. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the radiation failures, what we've seen is an 80% success rate in those patients. Local control is 100%, but those patients are in dire straits, they have aggressive disease, and a lot of them come to you with metastatic disease already. Uh, uh, the total in the 120 patients, uh, both, both criteria, Astro and Phoenix, in terms of PSA stability, gives us a 93 and 94 a percent across the board with these low and high risk patients. Dr. Hunt, we will we'll need to. Okay, lastly, and uh, that's all I need to, to show you, these are the uh, results from our Kaplan Meyer curves. Uh, in the low risk patients, we have no failures either locally or biochemically. Uh, in medium risk and high risk, we're still above 90%. But most importantly, these are not curves that are tending downwards. If you look at similar patients, high risk for radical prostatectomy, a recent article shows that in high risk patients, radical prostatectomy, you're at 45% for um, biochemical disease-free survival. Notice they start out at virtually 80% because 20% are going to fail due, immediately due to positive margins. And so, Overall, I think uh, in terms of continence, morbidity was minimal, continence was 100%, potency was 85%, these things are being reproduced. So in conclusion, uh, in patients who need treatment the most, focal therapy appears to be the procedure of choice. It is locally controlled, uh, uh, local control is much better than in radiation or radical prostatectomy uh, because we can retreat and treat extra extension. 
It promises to uh, markedly lower morbidity, and I think it's now an obligation to the medical community to do the proper studies to prove whether this is true in other people's hands. Because if it is, it changes the game completely. Uh, this basically removes radical prostatectomy and radiation uh, from the equation. And that is a huge change. And uh, uh, it will be fought. I will tell you that. Because uh, there's a lot of money being made in prostate cancer right now. So uh, I, I think uh, what we need to do is we need to push. And we need to say this is profound enough that uh, we have to know. And if it's yes, then that's great. If it's no, then we need to know that as well. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dr.